Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number one, ready for teaching on April 1. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. The lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and is titled Jesus Wins, Satan Loses. Pastor Mark Finlay was the author of our series of lessons this quarter. It's titled The Three Angels' Messages, and here's his two page introduction. On October 15, 1844, one week before the Great Disappointment, a boy had been born into a pious Lutheran family in Germany. His name was Friedrich Nitschke, and he would become one of modernity's most influential atheists. Believing that the Christian God was dying in the West, Nitschke railed against the Christian religion's continued moral influence, deriding it as a slave morality, the morality of the weak who, in an attempt to protect themselves from the strong, concocted such silly notions as, love your enemies. For Nitschke, modernity needed to get beyond antiquated notions of good and evil. A character in one of his books, Thus Spake Zarathustra, declared, Smash the old law tablets, meaning, of course, the Ten Commandments. The year 1844 also was important for Karl Marx, the founder of communism. Called the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, This work had been written by Marx that year, even if not published until 1932 by the Soviet Union. The manuscripts show the early development of Marx's ideology in which he argued for a totally materialistic reality that moved through various economic stages until the workers of the world would unite, overthrow their capitalist oppressors and create a utopia on earth. The year 1844 has been an important one for Charles Darwin, too. In what has become known as the Essay of 1844, Darwin produced one of the earliest expressions of his evolutionary theory, even if it was not then made public. Only in 1859, with the publication of On the Origin of Species, did Darwin publicly promulgate his view that all life on Earth originated from a common ancestor by natural and chance processes alone. The year 1844 was, however, the fulfilment of the 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14, And the same year that, out of the leftovers of the Great Disappointment, seeds were planted that would burgeon in a worldwide movement whose core message repudiated the guts of Marxism, Nishkian and Darwinian ideology. Contra Marx, the Seventh-day Adventist movement proclaimed that the great controversy between Christ and Satan, not a materialistic flow of history, explained the world history that would end not in a man-made communist utopia, but in the supernatural establishment of God's eternal kingdom. Contra Darwin, the Seventh-day Adventist movement taught that life originated not in the natural and chance process of random mutation and natural selection, but by the power of the Creator God, who in six days created life on earth and rested on the seventh. And, contra Nitschke, the Seventh-day Adventist movement proclaimed not only that God exists, but also that his universal code of morality, the old law tablets, the Ten Commandments, remains God's ultimate standard of judgment and binding on all humanity. Was it a coincidence that all these events happened in 1844? One should not think so. Marx, Nitschke, Darwin, three influential figures whose work has caused humanity irreparable harm. But, Amid all these errors, God did not leave the world without a witness to his truth, which is why, amid these destructive ideologies, he raised up a movement that would, over time, morph into the Seventh-day Adventist Church and that would proclaim his last-day truth to the world 
the three angels' messages. These are messages that, at their core, refute the errors and misconceptions promoted by these three terribly deceived men. The three angels' messages are, in a sense, the marching orders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and at their core, they are the gospel, pure and simple. But the gospel presented in the context of, as it says in 2 Peter 1.12, present truth. And these, the three angels' messages, are our study for the quarter. Our author, a native of Connecticut, USA, Mark Finley, an internationally known evangelist, was a vice president of the General Conference from 2005 to 2010. After retiring from full-time employment, he became an assistant to the president of the General Conference. Pastor Finley and his wife, Ernestine, have three children and five grandchildren. Sabbath afternoon, March 25. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you that your word is available to us and that as we study it this week, as we listen to the reading of the Sabbath school lesson and the Bible texts that go with it, that your Holy Spirit will be here to bless each one of us. We thank you that Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again, that each of us could have salvation. And as we open your word, we pray that our love for you and for him will grow. And today I'd like to pray for Tabernay A in Canada, for Lisi in Jacksonville, Florida, for Nicolaudia in Jamaica, and uh, Vanette Sims and many others who are listening in Jamaica as well, and Anita in Belize and Jocelyn in Barbados, TX Watchman whose car was totaled going to church recently, Julio in Angolia, Joan in... Angola, not Angolia, Joan in Antigua, CLC in Texas, Edward in Garoka in Papua New Guinea, and Jay Wynn, and I don't know where you live, Jay Wynn, but we're praying for you today, and we pray that for each of you who are listening, that God may be your support, Jesus may be your friend, and that the Holy Spirit will work through you today to bless others. Be with us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text is Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's read that again. Revelation 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In outnumbered, incredible stories of history's most surprising battlefield upsets, Cormac O'Brien recounts the stories of armies that, though seriously outnumbered, still won. It tells of Hannibal's army of 55,000 soldiers from Carthage defeating the invincible Roman army of 80,000 strong. It tells the amazing story of Alexander the Great's Greek army defeating the Empire of Persia. We too are in a life and death battle with a wily foe. We are outnumbered, fighting against incredible odds. The forces of evil appear invincible. We seem to be facing certain loss. Defeat seems inevitable. Victory appears out of sight. From a merely human perspective, it seems that Satan's forces will overwhelm us. But, thank God, though we are outnumbered, though the odds are, humanly speaking, stacked against us, though Satan's attacks are vicious, through Jesus we will win at last. The theme of the Bible's last book, Revelation, is this. Jesus wins, Satan loses. The heart of this battle is outlined in Revelation 12, the focus of our study this week. This study will give a good preparation for understanding Revelation 14 and the three angels' messages. Sunday, March 26, The Battle in Heaven Revelation 12 presents a stream of dramatic episodes, snapshots of the age-long conflict between good and evil that began in heaven, but will end here on earth. 
These episodes take us down the stream of time, from the opening scene of Satan's rebellion in heaven to his vicious attacks on God's people in the last days. Read Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9, which describes this cosmic conflict between good and evil. How possibly could something like this happen in heaven? What do these verses imply about the reality of free will, free choice? Revelation 12, beginning at verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. The freedom to choose is a fundamental principle of God's government, both in heaven and on earth. God neither created robots in heaven nor on earth, Created in the image of God, we as humans can make moral choices. The power of choice is closely aligned with the ability to love. If you take away the power of choice, you destroy the ability to love, for love can never be forced or coerced. Love is an expression of free will. Every angel in heaven was faced with the choice either to respond to God's love or to turn away in selfishness arrogance and pride. Just as the heavenly angels were confronted by love with an eternal choice, Revelation presents each one of us with eternal choices in earth's final conflict. There has never been neutrality in the great controversy, as we see in Luke 11.23, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And there will be none in earth's final war. Just as every angel chose Jesus' side or Lucifer's side, all humanity will be led to a final, irrevocable choice at the end of time. Who will have our allegiance, our worship, our obedience? This has always been the issue with humanity, and it will be so, however more dramatically, in the final crisis of earth's history. But... Here is the incredibly good news. Revelation 12 describes Christ's triumph in the conflict and all we have to do, using our free will, is choose to be on his side, the winning side. How great to be able to choose a side in a battle that you know beforehand it will win. So, to finish today, think about how sacred free will and free choice must be to Jesus who, though knowing that it would lead him to the cross, gave us free will anyway. 2 Timothy verse 9 in chapter 1 reads, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. What should this tell us about how carefully we should use this sacred but costly gift? Monday, March 27. Satan's Attack From the start, Satan sought to destroy Jesus, as we read in Revelation 12, 4-5, and we'll read that a little later. Yet, in every attempt, Satan failed. At Christ's birth, for instance, an angel warned Joseph and Mary about Herod's vicious plans, and they fled into Egypt. Jesus faced Satan's most enticing temptations in the wilderness with an, It is written, and thus found protection in the word of God. In his death on the cross, he revealed the magnitude of his love and delivered us from the penalty of sin's condemnation. In his resurrection, as our loving High Priest, he delivers us from the power of sin in our lives. Read Revelation chapter 12, verses 4 to 6 and verse 9, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 and verse 32, and Psalm 2, verses 7 to 9, and define the following symbols. And there are four symbols here for us to define. Dragon, 
woman, male child, rod of iron. So let's start with Revelation chapter 12 and verses 4 to 6. And that reads, Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of, for 1,260 days. And verse 9, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. And Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And then Psalm Chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son, today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. So the four symbols were dragon, woman, male child, and rod of iron. In the Bible, a rod is a symbol of dominion or rulership. A rod of iron is a symbol of an unbreakable, all-powerful, invincible rulership. Jesus faced every single temptation that we experience, but he came off a conqueror. The devil is a defeated foe. Christ has triumphed over him in his life, death and resurrection. Because Jesus has already defeated the devil on Calvary's cross, we can be victorious too. Christ's victory over Satan was complete, but the great controversy between Christ and Satan is not over yet. Nevertheless, when we accept by faith what Christ has done for us, our sin debt is cancelled and our sins are forgiven. We stand perfect before God, covered in Christ's righteousness. As Paul writes about being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And that's Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. If we are forgiven, there is nothing that we can be accused of, Jesus conquered and overcame forever the worst that sin and evil could do to him. He made the full assault on evil and overcame it. When we accept Jesus by faith, his victory is ours. And so to finish the day, why is the assurance of salvation, because of Christ's victory over Satan, so crucial to us? How can what Paul wrote in Philippians 3.9 be our own experience? Let's read that Philippians 3.9 again to finish today. Paul writes, Found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Tuesday, March 28, Accepting Jesus' Victory As depicted in the Bible, Jesus has never lost a battle with Satan. He is the mighty conqueror. He is the victor over the powers of evil. It is one thing to believe that Jesus was victorious over the temptations of Satan. It is quite another to believe that Christ's victory is our victory as well. 
Read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. What encouragement should you get from the fact that your accuser has been cast down? Revelation 12 verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down down. Although the battle still rages on earth, Satan has lost, period. This is true not only of Christ's ultimate victory at the climax of human history, but is also, it is true, in our battle over the principalities and powers of evil in our personal lives. Some Christians live in frustrated defeat. They are hoping for victory over some attitude or habit, but never grasp the reality of Christ's victory for them in their personal lives. Read Revelation 12, verse 11. What assurance of victory does Christ give us in this passage? Revelation 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Seven times in Revelation's messages to the seven churches, we find the expression, He who overcomes. Here, in Revelation 12, verse 11, we find this concept of overcoming again. The word overcome, in the original language of the text, is nikao, N-I-K-A-O. It can be literally translated to conquer, to prevail, to triumph, or to come through victoriously. Notice how it is possible for us to be overcomers. Revelation 12 verse 11 affirms that it is by the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation 5 verse 6, in prophetic vision, John gazes into heaven and sees a lamb as though it had been slain. The sacrifice of Christ is the focus of the attention of all of heaven. There is nothing more sublime to demonstrate the infinite, unfathomable love of God than the cross. When we accept by faith what Christ has done for us, our debt is cancelled, and we stand perfect in the sight of God. Our sins are forgiven, as we read in Ephesians 1 verse 7, Colossians 1 14, Colossians 2 14, and the accuser of our brethren has been cast down, as it says in Revelation 12 verse 10. Let's read those verses. Colossians 1 verse 14, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of of sins. Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And Colossians 2 verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We are redeemed, victorious and saved, not because of our own merits, but because of Christ's victories in our behalf. Wednesday, March 29. The Woman in the Wilderness. Read Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, and compare it to Revelation 12, 14 to 16. Notice carefully the time period, Satan's attack on the woman, God's church, and God's provision for his people. What are these voices talking about? Let's first of all read Revelation 12, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And verses 14 to 16. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed 
out of his mouth. The 1,260 days in Revelation 12, verse 6 are parallel to the time, times and half a time in Revelation 12, verse 14. This same time prophecy, describing the same time period, is found in Daniel 7, 25, Revelation 11, 2 and 3, and Revelation 13, verse 5. Let's have a look at each of those. Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. And Revelation 13, verse 5. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Because these are prophetic symbols, a literal woman with wings did not go into the wilderness, we apply prophetic time, the day-year principle. See, for instance, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4 verses 4 to 6 to these prophecies. So let's look at Numbers 14 verse 34. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. And Ezekiel 4 verses 4 to 6. Lie also on your left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three thousand and ninety days, so that you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days." I have laid on you a day for each year. This means simply that one prophetic day equals one year. Commenting on this same prophetic time period in Revelation 11 verse 2, the Andrews Study Bible states, Historicist interpreters, therefore, have generally understood the period of 1,200 and sixty prophetic days to mean one thousand two hundred and sixty literal years running from a d five thirty eight to seventeen ninety eight that's page one thousand six hundred and seventy three in the comments on revelation eleven verse two end of quote a corrupt church together with a corrupt state oppressed persecuted and at times slaughtered god's faithful people this fierce, satanic persecution of Bible-believing Christians was an extension of the great controversy between good and evil. Coming out of the darkness of the Middle Ages at the time of the Reformation, men and women were faced with a choice. Would they be faithful to the Word of God, or would they accept the teachings of priests and prelates? Once again, truth triumphed, and God had a people who were faithful to him in the face of mighty opposition. There are some fascinating and extremely encouraging expressions of God's care in these verses. Revelation 12 verse 6 uses the expression, A place prepared by God. Revelation 12.14 declares that the woman was nourished in the wilderness. And Revelation 12.16 declares, The earth helped the woman. At times of severe persecution, God provided for his church. As he did then, he will do the same for his end-time remnant. And so to finish today, describe a time of trial or difficulty in your own life when you could easily have been discouraged, but God provided a place of refuge for you and nourished you in your challenges. How did God provide support when you needed it most.
Thursday, March 30. God's End Time Remnant The devil has been at war with Christ since his rebellion in heaven, as we read about in Revelation 12, verse 7. Satan's purpose then, and his purpose now, is to seize control of the universe, as we read in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. The focus of his attention in the last days of earth's history is upon God's people. Revelation 12.17 emphatically declares that the dragon, that is Satan, was wroth, that's angry, with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. This expression, the rest of her offspring, also is translated the remnant in the King James Version. God's remnant remains loyal to Christ, obedient to his truth, and faithful to his mission. Read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. What characteristics of God's remnant, his last day church, are found in this verse? Revelation 12 verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 12.17, Satan, the dragon, is angry with the woman, God's church. The devil is furious with the people who keep the commandments of God, and he will do everything he can to destroy them. Eventually, he instigates a decree so that they cannot buy or sell, and will be imprisoned and face death, as we read in Revelation 13, verses 14 to 17. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. If Satan cannot destroy Christ, he will attempt to destroy the object of Christ's deepest affection, Christ Church. Earth's last war is not centred in the Middle East and the various conflicts there. It is centred in the minds of God's people scattered all over the world. It is a battle between two opposing forces, Christ and Satan. Again, no one is neutral. The central question in this final war is, who has your loyalty? Where is your allegiance? Heaven calls for believers who are so charmed by Christ's love, redeemed by his grace, committed to his purposes, empowered by his spirit, and so obedient to his commands that they are willing to face death itself for his cause. Our world is headed for a major crisis. But in Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus, and because of Jesus, our victory is assured, just as long as we stay connected to him, which we do by faith, a faith that leads to obedience. It all comes down to our own choice. And so to finish today, how do you see the reality of Revelation 12.17 played out in your own life, in your own Christian experience? That is, in what ways do you find the great controversy being played out in your own life? Friday, March 31 In a sense, we could argue that God had no choice. If he wanted beings who could love him and love others, he had to create them free. If they were not free, they could not love. And what would our universe be without love? 
It would be what some people have claimed, nothing but a mindless machine that works according to strict laws of cause and effect, and in which we have no free will, no free choice, and are nothing but flesh and blood packets of subatomic particles that follow only the laws of physics. Not exactly a pretty picture, nor does it represent what we know in and of ourselves to be true. Who among us thinks, for instance, that our love for our parents, our children, our spouses, is nothing but an arrangement of atoms? In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34 and 35, we read, The law of love, being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligent beings, depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience, and to all he grants freedom of will, that they may render him voluntary service. So long as all created beings acknowledged the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfil the purpose of their Creator. They delighted in reflecting His glory and showing forth His praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Why is Revelation 12 a fitting introduction to the three angels' messages, especially in view of the coming conflict at the time of the end? 2. How is Revelation 12 reassuring to you personally in the temptations and trials you face today? And 3. There are some who believe that our actions are largely determined by our heredity and environment. Do you agree or disagree? What role does our choice have in determining our behaviour? Discuss the relationship between our choice and God's power operating in our lives. Now for Inside Story, our mission story today is read by Sibella. Thank you, Sibella. Run to Jesus by Alicia Marie Harding. Homeschooling, a smoothly running schedule, a clean house, homemade healthy meals. These things are good and I am passionate about them as an American missionary mother raising four missionary kids in Zambia. But these things are also simply tools that help us honour Jesus. If the tools get in the way of Jesus, we need to run to him. It was about 10am. We were in the middle of homeschool and I was also multitasking with laundry and lunch preparation. Then one child snapped at another for making too much noise. Tears started flowing when a child couldn't figure out her math problem and an argument erupted between two siblings insistent on getting their own way. My own frustration was festering because I had to keep repeating instructions to an inattentive child. At that point, I knew I had two choices. I could give way to my flesh and with a harsh voice set everyone straight. Or I could go against my inclinations and with a sweet, cheerful voice invite all of us to take our problems to Jesus. What did we gain in work and school if Jesus wasn't in our hearts? Smiling, I called each child by name. Shayla, I said to my 11-year-old daughter. Wesley, I said, turning to my 9-year-old son. Sienna and Winston, I said to my 7-year-old daughter and 3-year-old son. We are going to talk all our problems out to Jesus and let him help us fix them. We knelt under a shade tree and told Jesus about our problems. We read in the Bible about how Jesus calmed the storm. We praised Jesus with a song. And then we shared hugs and started our day all over again, with Jesus in it. Again. Walking back into the house, each child's spirit was subdued. Once inside, each child listened more carefully to my instructions. There was a willingness to work out disagreements in a restful and respectful manner that focused on others, a sharp contrast with the earlier self-focused spirit. We were reminded that Jesus was near and his presence was more precious than any to-do list. 
Ellen White writes, mothers who sigh for a missionary field have one at hand in their own home circle. Are not the souls of her own children of as much value as the souls of the heathen? With what care and tenderness should she watch their growing minds and connect God with all their thoughts? Who can do this as well as loving and God-fearing mother? From the Adventist Time, page 245. Motherhood is more than running a home. It's about running your little ones to Jesus. Thank you for your mission offerings that support missionaries around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in a YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.